Today I want to share with you how to make collagen rich bone broth for under $2. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough and more. So if you enjoy learning how to be a modern pioneer in the kitchen, consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Now the first thing I want to mention is that at any time if you want to jump ahead be sure to open the description underneath this video where I'll have the timestamps listed for everything that I'm going to cover. I want to take a minute to speak to the beginner who may be new to making bone broth. Bone broth has grown in immense popularity but with that popularity sometimes it can become expensive to buy or to make. Now if you've been with me a while you know I have a lot of videos on how to make bone broth but if you're new I'll be sure to link to that playlist in the iCards and in the description below. And in those videos I show you how to make all types of bone broth chicken bone broth, beef bone broth, fish bone broth and pork bone broth. And there are varying costs associated with making different types of bone broth. Now beef bone broth can be a little more costly to make however I do have a video where I show you how to make a very reasonably priced bone broth and that's using the hooves of the cow. Now since bone broth is very popular to make sometimes depending on where you live you may, you may be able to find cow's hooves at your local grocery store. If not you can often find them at various ethnic grocery stores. And when you make fish bone broth that's very affordable and it's also wonderfully rich in nutrients that feed our thyroid. And all you have to do is ask your fishmonger if he'll sell you the head and the tail and the carcass of a fish. And I have found fishmongers at grocery stores very willing to do that when they're filleting fish to sell because most people don't like to buy a whole fish and then they'll have the head and the tail and the carcass left over and I've usually only paid about two dollars for it. Now when it comes to chicken bone broth I do have a video where I show you how to make chicken bone broth for a very reasonable price and that's simply by saving three carcasses of a whole chicken and then also if you've got them throwing in a couple of feet and throwing in some scraps and it, that is an affordable way to make chicken bone broth. However you need those three carcasses and with the rising prices of whole chickens it can become rather costly to get those three carcass. So today what I want to show you is how you can make a very collagen rich bone broth, a chicken bone broth, but for a very affordable price under two dollars. Now you may be wondering why we're after collagen rich bone broth regardless of what type of bone broth we're making. And technically the more appropriate term to say would be to make gelatin rich bone broth. Different parts of the bones are rich in collagen and collagen when you cook it becomes gelatin and that's what makes your bone broth very gelatinous. Once you make a collagen rich bone broth that is gelatinous and you refrigerate it it will turn into what looks like jello. Now you don't have to eat your bone broth looking like jello because once you warm it it will become in a liquefied state again and then you can use that warmed liquid as a sipping broth or as a base for making soups and stews. Or you can use your bone broth in place of water in certain recipes when cooking grains like rice. You can even add bone broth to smoothies. And when you add bone broth that's homemade that's very affordable to your smoothies you don't need to buy any of those collagen rich powders anymore that can be very expensive. Alrighty so now how are we going to make a collagen rich bone broth and do this for under two dollars? Well our secret ingredient is chicken feet. Now if you've seen my video on how to make chicken bone broth, my very original video on how to make chicken bone broth where I use the chicken carcasses, I recommend adding chicken feet. And the reason is chicken feet are extremely high in collagen. Now when making a collagen rich bone broth using chicken feet you really only need about six. Six feet that is. Now I believe this package has eight feet which is fine. The more the better. 
But what I did was knowing that you really just need about six feet was I looked for the smallest package that I could find. And this was a dollar 22. And this is about three quarters of a pound. Now, Chicken feet are $1.79 a pound, which is, I think, a little on the pricey side, but you really don't need that many. And the thing is, as we mentioned earlier, with the popularity of chicken bone broth, beef bone broth, so on and so forth, the ingredients that go into making it, and chicken feet are often a popular addition, is that these have gone up in price. But you really don't need a lot. So I was able to get this package that has, a, I think there's about eight in here, we'll find out when we open it, for just $1.22. The next ingredient that you'll want to add to your chicken bone broth are necks or backs from the chicken. Now, these necks were 89 cents a pound, and these also are close to three quarters of a pound, and they were a total of 58 cents. And it looks like there's about seven necks in here. Now my grocery store didn't have any backs, but when they do have backs, they're generally sold for 92 cents a pound. So if you can't find necks, but you can find backs, chicken backs are also wonderful to add when making a chicken bone broth. The next thing that you're gonna need are vegetable scraps. Now, if you have seen my other videos, you know that I always like to keep a scrap bag so that whenever I'm cooking and I'm maybe grating carrots or I've got the end of the celery or I've got some onion skins and things like that, I will save all of that in a bag and I'll just keep it in my freezer and then when I'm ready to make a bone broth, I'll pull it out and that's what I'll use. So basically we're just using vegetable scraps that may have otherwise gone into the garbage or the compost. Now one thing I do want to mention, these are onion skin, this is the base of the celery. I've actually quartered this. And if you want, another thing that you can do with this is save the very bottom and then plant it and you can grow celery. And you may get a lot of leaves, you may actually get a good amount of celery, it really depends, but it takes about 16 weeks and it is a cool weather crop. So if you have a cool spring or a, a cooler early summer, or uh, you have to wait until the fall one way or the other, depending on where you live, uh, you should give this a try and you can do it in a pot. Now, I have a video where I show you how to grow a lot of vegetables from scraps. And since we are going into the spring, or, or are in the spring now, that may be a fun video that you'd enjoy watching uh, to try your hand at growing some vegetables from scraps. And I'll be sure to link to that in the iCards and in the description below. And I generally also like to add uh, a few black peppercorns, but that's completely optional. And I often add some bay leaves, but again, totally optional. Now getting back to the scrap bag for a minute, I just want to mention that if you don't have this, if you have not saved any of your vegetable scraps, you can certainly add an onion, one carrot, and one celery stalk, and that'll do the trick. And then going forward from here on in, you can start to keep a scrap bag. And keep in mind, I've shared this with uh, you many times before, but I just want to stress this, especially if we have new viewers here, is that the onion skins contain as much nutrients as the onion themselves. So never throw away your onion skins. And I want to mention about organic versus non-organic. Don't worry if you can't find certain vegetables in the organic section of your grocery store or if they're out of your budget. All you need to do is look at the list on the internet. It's called the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. And onions are in the Clean 15, which means that they have very few pesticides used on them. So it is safe to save your onion skins, whether they're organic or not organic. And I know I take a little flack for this from time to time, but I am a firm believer that you just need to stay in your budget. And if you can't afford to buy anything organic, don't worry about it. Just stay in your budget and buy the best food that you can. And if it is food that is exposed to pesticides, a lot of pesticides, like the Dirty Dozen, just try to buy substitutes instead and steer clear of those. Or if that's all that's available to you, do your best. Try to wash them or maybe peel them. And in that case, don't save the peels. And the same goes for the chicken pieces that we're gonna be using today. 
if you can find feet from a grass-fed or organic chicken and backs and necks, same thing, that's wonderful. But if you can't, don't worry. And if you can't afford those options that are pastured and grass-fed, again, don't worry. Buy the chicken feet, the chicken backs, the chicken necks, whatever the case may be, that are available to you and within your budget. Because I'm a firm believer in saying that the reason we're moving away from a processed foods kitchen and moving to a traditional foods kitchen is to improve our health. And stress doesn't help anybody. And when you get right down to it, Creating bone broth is so nutritious and it is so much better than spending your money going through a fast food line or buying processed or prepared foods. Now, why are we stressing collagen rich and a gelatinous bone broth? And the reason is, is that the gelatin is very soothing to our digestive tract. So if you have any digestive upset, bone broth can actually help soothe all of that. Gelatin also helps our nails, our skin, our hair, it makes everything look better. So the more gelatinous our bone broth is, the better it is for us. Now, today I'm going to make this chicken bone broth in my Instant Pot. However, you can do this on the stovetop, you can do this in a slow cooker, or you can even do this in the oven. Now, I have a lot of videos that I show you how to do this in the slow cooker and how to do it on the stovetop, as well as how to do it in the Instant Pot. And the reason that I'm doing it in the Instant Pot today is because I kind of want to speed up the process since we're filming this. But the secret to making gelatinous rich bone broth is to moderate the temperature. The sweet spot, so to speak, for making very gelatinous bone broth is 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if you're doing this on the stovetop or in a slow cooker, don't worry if you don't have a thermometer. Basically, what you're going to do on the stovetop, and so many of my videos show you exactly how to do this, but what I want to explain here is that if you are doing this on the stovetop, you're going to bring it up to a boil, and then you're going to skim off any uh, scum that comes to the top, and then you're going to immediately turn your temperature down to the lowest setting on your stovetop. And you're just going to see an occasional bloop, bloop, bloop bubble like that, and you're going to want to leave the top off so that there is some evaporation, and that is exactly how you will make your bone broth on the stovetop, and that'll be about 180 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're protecting and preserving as much gelatin as possible, because gelatin doesn't like it to get too much hotter than that. What happens is it starts to, the expression is called break the gelatin, and it loses some of its gelatinous nature. Now, is it still nutritious? Of course. And I don't want you to worry if when you put your bone broth in the refrigerator, it doesn't gel as much as you'd like. It's still nutritious and still go ahead and use it. Now, you're basically going to do this the same way in the slow cooker. You're going to put your slow cooker on high, you're going to bring it up to a boil, and then you're going to turn it down to low or warm. Generally, what you're looking for is the same type of situation you are on your stovetop. You want just a bloop, bloop like that. Sometimes that's going to be on the warm setting on a slow cooker. Sometimes it's going to be on the low setting of a sl slow cooker. It really depends on the manufacturer. My slow cooker, which is made, I believe, by Hamilton Beach, has to be on warm to maintain that kind of one, uh, 180 degree Fahrenheit temperature. Now, in the Instant Pot, it is a little higher than 180 degrees Fahrenheit. But when I called the people at Instant Pot when I first made bone broth using it, they explained to me that if I set my Instant Pot on low, it would be, I believe, about 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So your bone broth may not come exactly as gelatinous as it would on the stovetop or in the slow cooker. However, I was very pleased with the results that I did uh, achieve the very first time that I made chicken bone broth in the Instant Pot. And when you have a very busy household, an appliance like these pressure cookers can be very helpful because when you make chicken bone broth in a slow cooker or on the stovetop, it does take about six hours. So when I'm in a little bit of a rush, 
I'm willing to sacrifice just a little bit of the gelatinous nature of my bone broth so that I can at least make some bone broth in the time period that I have available to me. But I think regardless of what appliance you use, you're going to be very happy with the results. Now, if you want to use your oven to make bone broth, yes, you can do that. But I recommend that you bring it up to a boil first on the stovetop and then transfer it to your oven. And if you can set your oven at 180 degrees Fahrenheit, that'll be perfect. But if you can't set your oven at 180 degrees Fahrenheit because the lowest it will go is 200 degrees Fahrenheit, again, that's going to be okay. Just as with the Instant Pot, there are some gradations in terms of the gelatinous nature of your bone broth, but it's still going to come out gelatinous and it's still going to be very nutritious. Now, I know I've given a lot of introductory information for the beginner who's making bone broth maybe for the first time, but now we'll jump in and get ready to make our collagen-rich chicken bone broth. Now, I've got about three quarters of a pound of the feet here, and I've got about three quarters of a pound of necks. And if you can't find necks, backs will certainly do. Now, when it comes to these chicken parts, you have two options. You can either brown them first in the oven, or you can just go ahead and put them into your pot just like this. I do find that if you take a few minutes to brown them first, it does give the final product a little better flavor. You can either roast them in the oven at about 425 degrees Fahrenheit, or you can just put them right under your broiler and brown them up quickly. Now you can also roast your vegetable scraps or vegetables, whatever you're using, along with your chicken parts, but I tend to not do that. I generally just leave them as is and just roast the chicken parts. Now I'm gonna roast these just on a plain baking sheet. It's not covered with anything. And the reason is we're gonna deglaze the baking sheet and get all the little, uh, the fond, the little bit brown bits, uh, which will make the bone broth very tasty. Now, if you're new to working with chicken feet, depending on where you buy them, they may or may not have had the yellow, the thick outer yellow skin removed. If they still have a very thick yellow skin on them, you will want to remove that. And you can simply do that by sticking them in boiling water uh, just for a little bit, you know, no more than 30 seconds, and then just peel that yellow, that tough yellow skin off. Often, maybe if you get them directly from a farmer, that yellow skin may be in place. Usually if you get them at the grocery store, that tough yellow skin will already be removed. Now, I know some of you may be a little squeamish working with chicken feed, but it's really not that bad, but you can certainly put gloves on if you're more comfortable. Now, if you want, you can certainly clip off the claws. I like to keep the claws, especially when my feet are coming from the grocery store because they're very clean. Uh, if they are dirty, you can always scrub them or you can certainly just clip them off. Well, I actually had nine feet, so this is gonna be a very gelatinous rich bone broth. And I've got seven necks as I thought. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop this into my oven and let this roast for a bit at 425 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, I've got the feet and the necks out of the oven and the pan is nice and hot. And while it's hot, we wanna deglaze it with some water. And then what I do is just let this sit for a minute or two and all the little bits will start to loosen up and I'll just take a little spatula like this and start to scrape them up and into the liquid. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and put all of these pieces into my uh, Instant Pot container. Now, keep in mind, I'm using an eight quart Instant Pot because that's what I have. You can certainly use a six quart, it doesn't matter. Now that I've got my pan completely deglazed, I'm gonna go ahead and pour this liquid right into my Instant Pot container. Once I pour that liquid in, then the next thing I do is just scrape off any little bits and bobs, so to speak, that have been left on my baking pan sheet, and I just go ahead and add those right into the pot. Now, the next thing I'm gonna do is pour more water in here so that the chicken feet and the chicken necks are completely covered. And that's all you wanna do is just add enough water to cover them. Now, don't worry if the chicken feet tend to float up a little, that's fine. You just wanna make sure that you have enough water where basically the majority of the feet and the necks are submerged in the water. 
Now, one ingredient that I didn't mention at the very beginning when we were talking about what we're going to be adding into this bone broth is some type of acid. Now, why are we adding some type of acid? And the reason is because the acid, which creates the water to be acidulated, will help draw out as much collagen as possible from the feet and the necks. Now, I generally like to use white vermouth or some sort of fortified wine for this process. However, I know a lot of you may not have that on hand, so instead what I'm going to use is a little bit of apple cider vinegar. Also, the reason that I'm using apple cider vinegar is because it's very affordable, especially if you make your own from apple scraps. And I have a video series, it's a three-part series, where I show you from start to finish how to make your own apple cider vinegar. So I'll be sure to link to that video. However, when it comes to using apple cider vinegar as your acid to acidulate your water, you really only need a small amount. Too much can give your bone broth an off-putting flavor. So I have no more than a tablespoon here. Now, if you want to use lemon juice, you can certainly do that as well. So in goes my apple cider vinegar. Now, I generally like to let this soak for about an hour to maximize the extraction of the collagen from the feet and the necks. However, if you're under a bit of a time crunch, try to do this for at least 20 to 30 minutes. Now that these have had a chance to soak for a while, I'm going to go ahead and add in my vegetable scraps. I've got onions, carrot, and celery scraps. Now the reason we want to add vegetable scraps or vegetables to our bone broth is because the bones are very rich in collagen, but they're not necessarily rich in vitamins and minerals. So the vegetables add a lot of vitamins and minerals to make our bone broth even more nutritious. And keep in mind, if you save your eggshells, you can definitely add them in here too for a wonderful boost of calcium. And please know that you can customize this bone broth, making it any way that you want. I have videos where I show you how to really boost the nutrition by using different fruits and vegetables. And yes, fruits. Fruits are wonderful like apples and pears, as well as citrus. These are all things that can be added to your bone broth to change up the flavor and change up the nutrition. You can also add herbs and spices. They have wonderful nutritional properties, and they're also excellent for providing anti-inflammatory properties to your bone broth, antibacterial, antiviral, antimicrobial properties. So always think about adding different spices and herbs to your bone broth. Today, I'm just gonna throw in a few peppercorns, just a little small handful there to give it a little bit of a little bit of a kick, a little bit of a spicy flavor. And I'm going to go ahead and add one bay leaf as well. Now I'm going to go ahead and just add in enough water to cover everything. And that's the key. You don't want to add more water than you need because by adding too much water, you will dilute the gelatin. Now, it's still nutritious, it's still wonderful for you, but you won't have any way of being able to tell if your bone broth really was gelatinous because the gelatin has been diluted. Not necessarily damaged, just diluted. And it's best when you use bone broth or drink bone broth for its various healing properties, you definitely want to make sure that you're concentrating that gelatin so that a cup of bone broth really does give you a lot of healing properties. Now, if it's watery, that's okay. You just might need to drink more than just one cup at a time. You might have to have two cups. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's awfully flavorful. <laughs> but anyways, so, but the bottom line is you just want to cover just enough so that everything is submerged, but you don't have more water than you need. So try not to go more than an inch over uh, making sure that everything's submerged. Now I'm going to bring this over to my Instant Pot and I'll show you how we're going to set it. Now there are a lot of different models of Instant Pots out there. However, the basic concept is that once you put the lid on, you want to make sure that your Instant Pot is set to sealing versus venting. 
And if you want to see a very detailed video on this, I'll be sure to link to it where I walk you through the whole process with a lot of up close shots and explain exactly what I'm doing. And that's in the uh, chicken bone broth instant pot video that I'll definitely link to. But that's the basic concept. You put your lid on, lock it, and make sure the little gadget on top, <laughs> for lack of a better word, is set to sealing. Then you're going to want to set your instant pot to either the pressure cook or the one that says soup. And then you want to make sure that you have it set on the low setting and there's the various buttons that you click to do that, low versus high. And then you want to make sure that you set it for two hours. Now it'll take a little bit for the Instant Pot to come up to pressure. And once it does, it'll let you know and it'll start the countdown from two hours. So your bone broth will be simmering for two hours. Then it'll click off after two hours and it'll just be sort of in a keep warm setting. And then at that point, you can do a manual, manual release and let the steam come out. And then you'll be able to remove the lid. Or if you're a little hesitant to do that, I know I was in the very beginning, you can certainly let the pressure come down slowly by itself. Well, I'm going to go ahead and put my scrap bag back in the freezer where I store it to get ready to fill it again. And we'll come back and check on our bone broth in two hours. Well, I let this simmer in the pressure cooker, the Instant Pot, for two hours on low, and it looks and smells wonderful. Now, earlier in the video, I mentioned that on low, the Instant Pot or pressure cookers in general tend to be, tend to heat to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. What I meant to say was 230 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's quite a bit over 180. So I always suspect 180 degrees Fahrenheit. So I always suspect that I may have to give up a little of the gelatinous nature, uh, but for the bit for but for less time, I can have the chicken bone broth uh, ready a little faster. However, now what we're going to do is we're going to take a little spider skimmer, I think these are called. I love this thing. This is perfect for the job. And I'm just going to start removing the uh, solids from the liquids. Now, after this, there are different steps you can take to what you do next. And uh, let me go over all of those, but also if you watch any of my bone broth videos, regardless of what type of bone broth I'm making, I go over all of this in great detail, step by step by step. But regardless of how you've made your bone broth or what type of bone broth you've made, once you go through this process where you've strained out the bulk of the solids, you have some options. If you want to take the very detailed approach, which I often do, is you can take a mesh strainer, put it over a bowl, preferably a deep bowl or even a stock pot, and then line the mesh strainer with cheesecloth or what I like to use, flour sack towels. And then I'll pour my broth, my bone broth, through the flour sack towel, through the mesh strainer, and all the liquid will go down into the pot or the bowl. And it'll be beautifully strained. And all those little bits and bobs that I wasn't able to get out with my, my hand strainer here will, be, will remain in the flour sack towel. Now, some people find that very tedious and they don't really worry about it. But sometimes if I'm looking for a really nice, clear broth, I like to do that. Second, the next step you can take now that you have your liquid is if you want to remove all the fat, you can run it through a fat separator. And it's just a little device. You've seen me use it very often and I'll overlay a picture so you can see what I'm talking about. And I'll be sure to put a link in the description below because I know so many of you ask me uh, where to get one of these. They're very clever. And what you do is you put your liquid into the fat separator. It looks like a big measuring cup and then you press the lever down and all the broth will fall down into whatever container you're putting it in a broth, a, a bowl, or sometimes I use a large measuring cup. And then you'll, you can watch because the fat has risen to the top and the hole is down in the bottom. And so you can watch as all the broth goes down and then all that's left is the fat. 
then generally I don't throw that fat out, I decant it into a separate container. So now I have this beautifully strained, fat-free broth to use for whatever purpose I want, a nice sipping broth, uh, or as a base for soups and stews, or using in place of water when cooking grains, whatever the case may be. But some people like to leave in the fat, and they like to leave in the fat for various reasons. It is very nutritious, but as I said, I don't throw it out, I use it in cooking. But some people like to have the fat in the broth. They find it, they like the mouthfeel, they find it very soothing. The other reason you may want to keep the fat in is if you decant this for refrigeration versus freezing, then that fat cap makes a seal basically as close to an airproof seal as possible, but it makes a seal that helps keep your bone broth underneath fresher longer. Generally, bone broth stored in the refrigerator without that fat cap, as I call it, can stay fresh about a week. And always know that your nose knows. If your bone broth at any point smells off or tastes a little funny, then it's probably time, unfortunately, to discard it. So if you refrigerate it, you want to try to use it up within a week. If you have that fat cap, it can generally stay fresh in your refrigerator about two weeks. But once you break that fat, fat cap, you've broken that quote-unquote airtight seal, so then you have to start counting that that's only going to stay fresh for about a week. Now what I like to do is to decant my bone broth that I have strained and defatted and put it in one cup and two cup size jars and then I like to freeze that. And in the freezer, without developing any freezer burn or anything like that, it can last at least three months. I've often had bone broth in my freezer for six months. So, and, and when I defrost it, it's just as great as the day I made it. And some people, have, I know some of you have shared with me, you've had it in your freezer for a year and it's still good. So that's all good to know. But I wanted to just go over those things with you to know that you do have options. Now, there is a third option. This is the quick and easy one. And this is what we're going to do today. After we strain these solids, we're going to get a jar and we're going to, or you could do this in a bowl, whatever you want, and we're going to decant it very carefully pouring it into the bowl or the jar. What happens is we're going to do this for refrigeration purposes. So we're not going to defat it, nothing like that. And what happens is all the little bits and bobs that I would have other, otherwise caught in my cheesecloth will sink right down to the bottom. And when you get down to that bottom part of that little kind of little bit of sludgy stuff, you can just puree it and add it to, it's already in essence pureed to a certain extent. You can add it as a, a addition for nutrition to soups and stews, whatever you want. And your fat cap is going to be on the top. So you can go ahead and put the whole things in the refrigerator. When you get ready to use it, you can skim off that fat cap, save the fat, you've got your broth, and as you scoop your broth out and you get to that very bottom that tends to be a little, as I said, kind of like a little sludgy, then you can just add that to a soup or stew. Now what to do with these scraps? Different people have shared with me different opinions. Some people will t pick out all of the vegetable scraps, rinse them well, and then add them to their compost pile. I have not tried that. What I will do is I will go ahead and pick out, let me see if I can get a piece here, I'll pick out one of the, the feet and or the necks and or the backs, and I'll see if I feel in my per, my humble opinion, my personal opinion, if I think I might be able to get more collagen released from these. And if I feel that they look like they've got some hope to them, I will save these in a bag or I'll just put them right back depending on my time schedule and start up another, uh, another batch. But I will add fresh vegetables uh, or vegetable scraps, whatever I have. Uh, so that's something you want to make your decision about. Now, if you decide to keep them you'll, and you refrigerate them, you really want to use them in a day or two. Otherwise, just put them in your freezer and use them at least within two to three months. Now what I'm going to do is lift out this liner. Now you want to be very careful. This is, this is a little warm, so I'm going to be using pot holders. The first thing that I want to do is take out a little bit of this broth so that I can go ahead and put this, this a little bit more, 
and put this into the fridge and let this cool so that we can see how it came out. Now this is a half gallon jar. You can use whatever you have. If you have quart size, whatever the case may be, and just have as many jars as you're going to need to fill this, uh, to empty out your uh, container, your stock pot, your uh, slow cooker liner, whatever you've used to make this. Now what I like to do is I've warmed this jar. I don't want to risk anything breaking, even though they are canning jars in my case. Uh, but whatever jar you use, I would recommend rinsing it in very warm water first so that you help temper it a little bit. And then just kind of as a precaution, I'm not sure if this one will, oh yeah, this fits all the ways in. But I like to put, so maybe if you had a large long handled tablespoon or something like that, putting metal into the glass jar will also help prevent breakage. It'll absorb the heat as this uh, goes into the jar. And then let me get this. I'm right-handed, so I have a little more strength on my right side. So let me pick this up. And then what we're going to do is, like I said, we're going to pour this slowly. Now there will be, uh, we're going to try to leave as much debris as we can in the bottom of this pot as we pour slowly. But it's not going to be a perfect situation, so there will be some down on the bottom. It'll eventually sink, but that's okay. Alrighty, let me see how I can do this. <laughs> Oh, okay, here we go. Just take it nice and slow. Alrighty, there we go. I'm just going to fill that right up and look at how much more I still have. Alrighty, I'm going to go ahead and remove this and I'm going to set this aside and we're just going to let this cool before we put the cap on to refrigerate it. Now I'm estimating that maybe I have about another quart left in here. So I'm going to go ahead and get a quart jar and we'll go from there. Well, I've warmed my jar. I've got my metal spoon in there. And now we'll go ahead and see what we can get into this jar. I'm guessing it's about a quart. Maybe it's a little more. I've actually still got a little more in here after decanting this into the quart size jar. So since it's, I'd say it's about a cup full. So I'm just going to go ahead and pour this into a mug and enjoy it now. And now what I like to do is because I know some of you who have made bone broth and then you said, oh, it wasn't too pleasing. A little sea salt goes a long way because I don't add any salt in when I'm making bone broth, whatever type of bone broth I'm making. And the reason is I want to control the salt when I use it, whether it's to drink it or to use it in a recipe. So not salting my bone broth during the process of making it gives me a lot more flexibility. But look at what we got out of this. Can you imagine it? Just a handful of feet, a handful of necks, and we've got this glorious hot. <laughs> we've got this glorious bone broth. Now this is the fat cap that I'm talking about. And you can see it more clearly in this half gallon jar. And that'll harden and that'll keep this bone broth nice and fresh for, as I said, probably up to about two weeks. You know, bone broth, like so many things that are homemade, it can be very subjective. And a lot varies on what you're using when you make bone broth, what vegetables you've added, so on and so forth. So really, as I said, always do the sniff test, the nose nose, <laughs> and you're gonna always give it a little taste. Um, now, the fat cap on this smaller jar is considerably less. So I'm gonna go ahead and use this one first before I use this one. Now, if you're new to using the Instant Pot, or you've been using it a while and you may be wondering what is the best way to clean it and how do you get odors out of it because it does tend to hold odors. And I want to let you know that I have a video where I show you the proper way to clean the Instant Pot. And again, as I like to do, I had called the manufacturer and asked them to walk me through the steps for how to clean an Instant Pot correctly. And they really provided me with a lot of information. So definitely check out that video if that's something that interests you. Alrighty, now let's go look at how our cooled bone broth did. Well, now this gelled up beautifully. Now, I want to be honest with you. If you put three carcass, just by themselves, three carcass in your Instant Pot and make chicken bone broth, it's not going to come this gelatinous. This is more like what you'll see if you use just three carcass in a stovetop version 
or a slow cooker version. But because we had all those feet, it makes all the difference in the world. So if you do use the three carcass and you can throw in six feet, that's wonderful too. But because we had all those feet as well as the necks, now if you have backs, that's also helpful. But just with those chicken feet, and I think maybe if you, even if you just did the chicken feet alone, you would get a very gelatinous bone broth like this. So this is going to be wonderfully nutritious and wonderfully healing uh, to our digestive system and great for our nails, our skin, our hair. We've really got something wonderful here. Now, if you would like more videos on how to make all types of bone broth, including ones of beef bone broth that's very affordable, be sure to click on this playlist over here. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.